let's start functional programming. Functional programming is getting a whole lot of attention, and I, for one, find that also very confusing at times. Uh, if you ask three different programmers, what is functional programming exactly, like in one sentence, you're very likely to get even four different answers, and that's confusing. And all those answers may also include words like lazy evaluation or functors or monads, and these sound scary and big, and what are they? And today I wanted to talk a little bit about what really is functional programming and really cut through all the hard words and go through the basics of it. I also want to explain a little bit why the hype, because functional programming is not new, so why are we all of a sudden all talking about it? And last but not least, I will use Python to give you some examples of functional programming in a language that is not even purely functional. So what is functional programming? What is it really all about? And the answer is, it's all about state. Or better, it's all about the absence of state. Um, what is state? Take this door, for example. This door can have one of two states. It can be open, like it is right now, or it can be closed. Those are the states of the door. That's pretty easy, right? Let's look at that in code. We have an object, door. The door has a property, which is true. Now, if we want to close the door, uh, sorry, the property is open, and open is true. The door is open. Now, what if we want to close the door? We simply change the value of that property to false. In doing so, we change the state of that property. Another example is the variable below, which is OTSConf, an awesome OTSConf, so OTSConf is awesome. Let's make that even more awesome by adding two exclamation marks. That's very simple. You just take the variable and add two exclamation marks, thereby once again changing the state of this variable. And that's important. I'm going to give you one more example <coughs> because it goes a little bit to side effects as well. Um, this is a function that does something that I'm sure no, none of you ever wants to do, but it takes a list with names, and then for every name in that list, um, doubles it, basically, it's name plus name, and insert and, and changes that, so that it prints out Jan instead of, uh, Jan Jan instead of Jan, Kim Kim instead of Kim, etc. In so doing, this function changes the state of the list. And because it changes something outside of it, the function, it, the list is not inside the function, it's outside of it, we call this a side effect of the function. And in this case, the function doesn't do anything else. All it does, its entire purpose is having a side effect. It doesn't return anything. So that is state. Now, if you're coming from imperative programming and you're looking at this and you're like, yeah, I do this every day. These are very normal things for me. Why are you making such a big deal about state? And also, why would I want to use anything that doesn't allow me to do this? This is pretty awesome. Like, why not? And the reason is, there are a couple of problems with state. The first problem is, there's a thing called race conditions, and it has very little to do with horses. Now, race conditions happen when you have a program that um, the outcome of the program depends on more than just the code you wrote. It actually depends on the sequence of execution or the timing thereof. It, that sounds a little abstract. Let's take this example. Um, we're going to do groceries today. There's a lot of groceries in this talk. Um, here we have a grocery list with some fruits. We're eating healthy. And a basket. And ultimately the goal is to get all the things in the list, on the list in the basket. And we even do a little check to make sure if the things that we want to put in the basket are not already there, because we want one of every item. Now, if we execute this on one single thread, it's probably going to go, OK, we'll just get everything in the basket and be very happy. But what happens if we execute this two threads instead of one? And I did a little drawing here. Instead of threads, we have people, and the people share the grocery list, so they both check on the same list, and they both put the items in the basket using the function you just saw before. Now, how would that go? One possible scenario is the first person checks for, huh, is there an apple in the basket? Nope, it's empty. And then goes and gets the apple, puts the apple in the basket, at which point the second person, who's a little slow to start, 
looks at the basket and is like, is there an apple in there? Yes, there's an apple in there. So it does absolutely nothing. Goes to the next item. Then both check the list. Is there an orange? No, there's no orange. Both people run through the supermarket, getting the orange, putting the orange in the basket, at which point there's two oranges in the basket. That's a race condition. And this is something that, this sounds a little ridiculous with your supermarket and your groceries, but this is something that actually happens. And it actually happens quite a lot. And it's a big problem because if I run this program again, instead of two oranges, I may end up with two cherries, or I may end up with two of everything, or just one of each. Making it incredibly unpredictable and making this a very hard bug to reproduce, if at all. So finding this bug is hard. It's going to take you time. And this is one of those times where you put a lock statement in your code before you run it, and then all of a sudden it works, whereas before it didn't, just because you slow down the execution a little bit. Those are race conditions. And they are relevant today more so than ever before because we now have computers that don't have just one core. They don't have two cores. They have many multiple cores. Your phone has more than one core, which means that we're going to execute programs in parallel. So we're going to break them down in little pieces and uh, execute all these pieces on different threads or processes. And that makes a problem like a race condition an actual problem we're dealing with today. This is also why it's getting so much attention today. Um, but it's not the only problem with state. Another problem you can have with state is that it can make things incredibly complex. Now, we only had a grocery list and we only had to check the basket. Um, but what if you ju don't just have a basket? What if it also depends on your mood that day or uh, whether the supermarket is the right kind of supermarket or all these different states that the world can have? And the more states you have in your program, the more checks you need to make for whether it's in the right state. So you end up with this hugely complex thing that even a very talented human being will find mind-boggling and will end up making at least one mistake at one point. So that's complexity. I'm not saying functional co programming is not hard. It's just not this complex in this specific way. Um, and then we have a last one, unpredictability. And you saw a little bit of that in race conditions, but in this case, I'm more referring to the unpredictability of functions. And I did my very best to create the most unpredictable function in the world, um, which is a very simple one as well. It basically takes the external variable x, takes its value, multiplies it by two, and then changes the state of x as well. So it's like there's state everywhere. And the first time you print that, you get two. The second time you print the exact same thing, you get four. Just by looking at that function, you have no idea what it will return. And this is unpredictable, and this is something you don't really want in your program. You cannot just look at your code and know what it's going to do. You have to check some other part of your code first. Um, so these are some of the problems with state. And this explains why writing code that has the least possible amount of state is very often a good idea. But again, if you're coming from a purely uh, imperative world, you may still be wondering, yeah, but, but changing the, the state of a variable, I do that. how do I write something without that? So I wanted to give a couple of examples. Um, remember our door? It was very simple, right? It could be open or closed. The end state was that it was closed, so I start with false, and then I want to open it, and I change the state to true. Now, let's say we cannot actually change the state of this property. What would we do? In this case, I created a struct, an immutable struct, that is door. I gave it an ID just for fun, and um, false because it's closed. Then there's a function, and that function opens the door. It takes the door as an argument, and then from that door gets the current state and the ID and returns a new object that is the ID of the door and true, because right now we want it to be open. So we have a new door. This is crucial. We did not change the actual door object created before. This is a, the functional way of writing the same thing. I know it looks a little bit more complicated than the first one, but bear with me. Um, now, Remember that very unpredictable function from before? 
there's quite a simple way to make that incredibly predictable, and that is by giving uh, x as an argument to the function and returning x times 2. In this case, you can look at the function and you know that for a given x, it will always return the same thing. Which brings me to the two kind of defining characteristics of a functional program. Um, a functional program, which is as stateless as possible, will have immutability. Uh, variable objects will not be mutable, and it will be predictable, meaning that for any given input of a function, it will be return that same output. So, like we saw before, if, if your input x is 10, it will always return 20. It doesn't depend on some external state. So these really, if you, if you think like, what is functional programming all about, then ultimately it is this. Now, let me go back to the race condition and see what went wrong and how we can fix that in a more functional way. Uh, what went wrong is that both threads shared the same state, and they were both manipulating the state, same state, namely the state of the basket. Now, we could quite easily solve this problem by each giving them half of the grocery list, their own basket. They will go out in the supermarket, do their own shopping, at the end of the day, come back with two filled baskets, and then simply put those baskets together. That's a very, very simple way to solve this problem. Um, in doing so, we still haven't um, made the entire code functional, right? There's still the function internally are still non-functional. So just as a fun exercise, I wanted to go through them and see how we can go from imperative to functional code or functional functions. To recap a little bit what the, what the problem was all about, we had the groceries and the basket, we had the get groceries function, and just to make it a little bit more fun, I, did a, I added a buy groceries function. And um, because we don't really have a price, the price will be the number of characters in every string in the grocery list. I'm pretty sure your local supermarket will not agree with this, but. Um, so we have to buy groceries, and we will just add up all those characters, and then we'll have a total sum, and that knowing that sum equals buy. And then finally, so this is how we then call the functions one after another in a very stateful world. How to make this functional? Let's take the first one. In the, in the imperative uh, solution, we use a for loop. In a functional uh, function, one way to avoid using a for loop is by using a recursive function. In a recursive function means that it, a recursive function is a function that calls itself. So basically what we do here is we take, we have a function that takes the grocery list and the basket, checks if there's still groceries on the list. If there's no groceries on the list, we will just give you the basket because we're done. We're done shopping. If there are still some groceries on the list, we will create a new basket, which is the old basket plus the first item on the grocery list, and we will chip that item away from the grocery list and give both things as arguments back to the function, and we will repeat that and repeat that and repeat that until, once again, there are no more groceries left, in which case we are done. And if you've never seen a recursive function before, this looks a little tricky, so look, look over it at your own time, but Eventually what this does is it does never change state of a variable. It just gives it back as an argument and recreates the same thing. Um, another way to do this, another way to replace a for loop, and this is why I added a function, is by using a map. And this is one of those things where Python is really awesome because it comes with map built in. Um, what we do here is we create another function, which is by item. And as you may remember, buying an item basically just means calculating the sum of the characters in the string, and, um, and that's it. So that's all this function does. And then buying all the groceries means summing up all of that. So what we do here is we have a map that maps over all the items we have in our basket. The basket was an argument to the function. Um, so we, we get this basket, we map over all the items in the basket, and for every item, we calculate um, 
so the, the number of characters, right? And then once we do that for that item, we put it into a new list. And then map returns a new list with all these um, sums of characters. So instead of uh, manipulating the, or changing the basket, we create a whole new list. Again, we're not changing any states. Uh, ultimately, we also do a sum of that list because we want to get the total. But I think that one is pretty straightforward. Um, so these are the functions. And then the way we can call all of that is by doing it nested. Uh, so we have the get groceries function that takes as an argument the grocery list as well as an empty basket. And what it returns is a full basket. And that will then be the argument for your buy groceries function, which uh, will return the total of all the characters of all the strings in the grocery list, or in this case, in the basket, which ends up at 37, which is like, whatever. Um, so these are your functional groceries. This is how you do it the functional way. And one thing, um, when you look at this, you can note that because all these functions are self-contained, because they don't rely on some external state, it becomes much easier to just give them two different threads and execute them separately. Whereas in an imperative um, the way of doing this with where you have some external states, that becomes much harder. And well, as we saw, race conditions are much more likely to happen. So this was functional programming 101, like 1001. Um, if anything, I hope you got from this that functional programming is all about statelessness. It's not completely stateless, but it's almost completely stateless. And that is the hard part. If you're coming from imperative programming, this is what makes functional programming hard. It's not all those words I mentioned before. It's not monads or lazy evaluation. It's the fact that it doesn't have state. Because your mind is so used to, to using state everywhere in your program that figuring out how to save the same problem, the problems you've been solving for so long, in a completely different way is, is the thing that makes it so hard. And yes, then there are all these other concepts and language features like monads, but they come, they, they exist because in a stateless world, they can exist and they help you do things in a stateless way. They are not, however, what functional programming is all about. Um, one other thing, you can do this in Python like I did today and I really wanted to show you that it's not about the language you use, it's not, it's a little bit, but not completely about the language you use and it's not about the, the big words. However, if you really are excited about functional programming and you want to learn functional programming, I would encourage you to use a functional language like Haskell or Clojure because these languages will force you to actually write stateless code. Whereas Python, I mean, anyone who's ever written code with Python probably knows that you don't have to. It's a choice. It's really nice to be forced. Also, these languages are optimized for doing things a functional way, which can also be very, very helpful. Um, that was my talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm.